Um, thank you very much for coming. I know how busy you are. I know what a busy day all of you have had. So thank you so much uh, for being here. This is our first ever in-person session uh, of the King's Health Partners Academic Surgery Programme. I must thank Procar for being an absolute inspiration to us all. So it's absolutely uh, brought us together through a series of online events. We've had some fantastic presentations, fantastic discussion. All of the conversations have focused on facilitating outstanding surgical science collaboration, and that's been across all of the campuses in KHP, uh, supporting hybrid surgical and implementation trials, and improving education for the next generation of our workforce and our leaders uh, and students in surgery. Um, I must thank CMR. I don't know if the CMR people are quite out there here. Hello, CMR people. That's nice to be waved at. Thank you. Uh, CMR is sponsored uh, tonight's event, and we're so very, very grateful. We've been working with CMR and their Versius robot, and I know Tom and my team went to see the robot today. I think Tom now thinks that he is a surgeon, which is really quite terrifying uh, on a number of levels, but I think it's, it's all good. Uh, and the work with that assisted surgery in neurology is really starting to reduce length of time in operation. It's reducing length of stay and it's improving outcomes for patients and patients are going home much more quickly. So we are very grateful uh, to CMR, but we're mostly very grateful to Procar for bringing us all together and doing so very well. I wanted to thank a number of people before I say any further. This is our implementation team, the people who really make it happen. Henry is here, Jen and Remy are outside, Christine is not here, and Saida Hasni and Mohammed, who is our head of comms, is not here. So give them a round of applause because they really uh, make this happen. Tom from communications spent all day learning how to operate with the CMR, so much so he tells me that he actually wants to do the next cases. And of course the CMR team and Seb, Seb Orseline, uh, the head of biomedical engineering and imaging and the head of surgical and interventional engineering is here. Thank you, Seb. Now, I just want to say a few good things amongst all this virus and terrible stuff. On the educational front, we have people like Rana Zakri, Arun Sahai, and Shamim Khan driving forward education, and Aubrey Botha, our upper GI surgeon, really doing fantastic seminars within surgical and interventional engineering. So thank you, Aubrey. And finally, to say politically in urology, we really have attained a different peak because Tim O'Brien, who is here, just finished a most successful uh, term as president of the British Association of Urological Surgeons. Tim, again, congratulations. So let me tell you how uh, we incorporated CMR Versius into an established 20-year robotic surgical program. Indeed, this is a 30-year program uh, because it all started with John Wickham 30 years ago in the same legendary Theater 7 where I operate or used to operate till before the pandemic. And that is the BBC's image of the probot, which was completely autonomous, i.e. you programmed the inside of the prostate for BPH, you pressed a button, Wickham would have a TIA, it didn't matter, he was on the floor washing his hands, the machine would just vaporize the inside of the prostate. That was 30 years ago, 30 patients, and it happened at Guy's. Unbelievable. And then uh, Ben Chalakam, who was my student at the time, along with Lou Kavusi, did the first randomized control trial of robotic surgery in the world. Very few people will know this. This is now 20 years old. It's called Star Trek Systematic Transatlantic Randomized Telerobotic Access to the Kidney. You love that? Inspired by Star Trek, of course. Uh, and it had two arms. This was a robot from Hopkins which could put a needle into a kidney and we controlled it in those days with four ISDN lines. You never hear of ISDN lines. The lines are still actually attached 
to the endourology lab in guys, but they don't work clearly. And 150 of these needle punctures were done with the robotic arm and the other 150 by a human being. Richard Tiptoft, who established our department, was one of those surgeons who put in the needles. I still remember this. This was four years before his retirement in 2006. For the first time showing that the robot arm was much more accurate than a human being, although slower. So uh, certain lessons to learn. And then came uh, the Da Vinci system. Many of you, the urologists here know about this, but many of you don't. So the patient is seated somewhere or hidden somewhere uh, in those drapes. The surgeon is sitting at a console controlling things with their arms and legs and the head uh, is buried inside the console cutting off a light beam so that the surgeon can actually see things in 3D HD vision magnified uh, 10 times. So the prostate gland uh, looks like a football. You can see the nerves, you can see the sphincter with accuracy that is beyond what we can see with the human eye today. And look, my glove size is seven and a half. The robot's glove size is seven millimeters. So uh, that's how uh, accuracy with the Da Vinci system changed. When we started at Guy's, uh, we were the only center performing robotic assisted radical prostatectomy, 1%. So if you look at the upper left pie chart, uh, in the blue and the light blue is where it is today. 91% in the United Kingdom are now performed robotics. So over a 20 year period, we have completely changed how one operation, the commonest robotic operation is performed today. And I'm pleased to say that we are the biggest robotic center at KHP in the United Kingdom. In fact, in Europe, uh, other than Martini Clinic, which is just behind us, and the hospital in Gronau, in Eastern Germany, just ahead of us, we are the largest center. Even during the pandemic, we did nearly 1,300 cases. And you say, well, uh, volume is, doesn't matter. What about quality? Look at that chart on the right. The red dot is national data. This is not data rigged by us. The red dot is national data on erectile function. Now, there have been a number of trials, of course, because you have to put them through the acid test, the Lancet trial of open versus robotic radical prostatectomy. Uh, the coral trial, which Shamim and I championed, cystectomy, open robotic and laparoscopic. The razor trial, 15 centers in the United States comparing open and robotic surgery. And the recently published IROC trial again, which our team was a part of comparing intracorporeal reconstruction after robotic surgery versus standard open cystectomy with an extracorporeal cut on the tummy. You may say, well, uh, what do these trials tell us? Surgery remains despite these technological advances an art more than a science. So if you are wanting to have robotic surgery, you need to find the best robotic surgeon that you can get hold of, someone you can trust. And if there is no such surgeon near you, then an open surgeon will do as long as they are the best surgeon around. So it's about the art, not just the technology. This made headline news 10 years ago, and this is something we changed. Robotic surgery caused more regret because the patients felt they were having high-tech surgery, and therefore their erections and continence should actually be better. Some of them regretted, and David Albala, a colleague in the States, reported this in the Journal of Urology, alarming results, and our nurses stepped in. So this is not just a bunch of robotic enthusiasts. Our nursing team stepped in and said we must counsel the patients before we operate on them. And now this has become standard of care where they are taught pelvic floor exercises. They're shown what a vacuum device looks like. They're shown what an injection looks like. And that has completely taken out the regret. It had nothing to do with the tech. It had to do with high quality nursing care uh, at GSTT. One of the problems we had was the machines don't have any sense of touch. They still don't. Wire pulley systems, which is what the robots are, have difficulty in feeling uh, organs. So, we had a number of PhDs which came out of our program. This is one of them, uh, Yang Li, who actually devised these little indentation probes. They were an air cushion probe whereby you can move air within the cushion and it sends the signal back. And you will see on the right, these red spots are under the capsule prostatic tumors which are anterior. The finger can't feel it. You can actually dodge those cancers and cut beyond them. We were the first to introduce uh, image-guided surgery. This is in 
the Platinum Journal, which James has been very closely associated with. These are the first images of MRI tracked with magnetic tracking. This was Steve Thompson's PhD, now 20 years old, uh, showing that you can do uh, image guided robotic surgery. This came out of King's. This was sold for 108 million as part of the new Auris system. This is a iPad. Imagine you take the iPad, put it in front of the patient, and you can literally look inside the patient's brain or the pelvis, see the prostate, see the cancer, exquisite, fine detail, so that you can steer clear uh, of the tumor. This is funded by the NIHR I4I from Seb's lab. Uh, this is inner sight, and this is the exquisite detail uh, of kidney cancers that you get uh, and the blood vessels, you can literally peel away the tumor from the surrounding structures and you can plan how you are uh, going to operate on this. This is funded uh, and a trial is about to start. And you see, easy to do, uh, easy to take into the operating room. We were just uh, showing uh, James and Ian in our new surgical and intervention engineering lab that we have invested and not just in rigid robotics where the wrist is flexible, but also completely flexible instrument. And this shows a robot which has AI and surgical cognition learning uh, from the surgeon's movements and actually learning from the surgeon's bad movements. One of the things which we did about seven years ago was trying to operate remotely. This is 5G remote operating. We used the HoloLens 2. We used a beautiful glove called the NeuroDigital. You will see the surgeon has a glove on their hand. You can feel inside the patient without making an incision. We have proprietary uh, IP guided little instruments with 3D printed tips. And then you bring in 5G to have uh, splicing, real time splicing in between. The first such operation in the world was done by us on Facebook Live in 2018 before the Chinese colleagues operated on a hepatobiliary cancer. We have a major interest in 3D printing. This is the world's such 3D printed kidney. You see, this is little Lucy. Panka Chandak, our student, did this, whereby little Lucy had renal failure, and the father wanted to donate a kidney, but the father's kidney was too big for Lucy. So what does Chandak do? He goes and prints Lucy's abdomen and prints, 3D prints the dad's kidney, and they plan where to put this. This was on the BBC, big news, and won the Norman Tanner Prize. We actually did a phase one study of 3D printed prostates. This is the first such reducing positive surgical margins in T3 cancers where you can feel the tumor from 35 to 10%. This is just about to go to a major trial funded by the Urology Foundation, and Alejandro uh, from my lab is here, will be leading this trial. With Andrew Hung and the Royal College of Surgeons, we can now add a black box to the intuitive Da Vinci system. This is called the RCS mastery study, and we can measure what is called automated performance metrics. This is going to be very helpful, we feel, for the next generation of surgeons to see whether there are certain movements that experienced robotic surgeons make, which the human eye can't see, which can be reproduced, such as to give better continence or better erectile function. This is very, very exciting for the next generation of surgeons. We've just been into surgical and interventional engineering, and if you haven't been there, I urge you to get in touch with 7i so that you can visit it. This is a place like no other, and I do not know of any other such facility. It's in this building in the old St. John's Dermatology Institute in the basement. It's called surgical and interventional engineering. It's got the fastest computers, the best imaging, and a virtual operating room with cadaveric facilities. This is where the action is going to happen with AI in the next five years. And it is right here in a hospital building. It's not somewhere in a village uh, out of Kings whereby you never see the clinicians again. So this, we want you, the students, and I see Alice here from the Surgical Society, we want our students, we want our surgeons to be in this space uh, doing this work with our engineers and scientists. And then during the COVID, we got this fantastic 33 million investment from UKRI or Trustworthy Autonomous Systems. And the press got of it, hold of it and said, well, how do we reduce the black lock? And the real story will be told to you by Ian. But they said, well, why don't you split yourself into seven robots and the machine can do the work while you just control seven different ones. So split yourself. And I said, this is just science fiction. Yes, a machine can suture better than a human being. But today to think that you can get rid of judgment 
and completely autonomize uh, an operation is science fiction. So we still need human beings and our jobs are for at least the next 20 years not at risk. So here is the background uh, Amion Switch uh, comes in, uh, uh, Nick Raison, uh, he brings in the validation and training of this. Uh, this is non-technical and technical skills based on simulation. This was his PhD which won the prize and one of the things he's famous for is doing what sports psychologists do, training surgeons by training their brains to perform better. On the left is the randomized control trial which won the Blandy Prize showing that if you imagine the steps of a particular operation you can actually perform better. Tennis players, football players, the ladies who are going to win the World Cup on Sunday do all that all the time and yet we see as surgeons that we are somehow decerebrate. And on the right side Nick is showing for the first time in Seb's lab with functional MRI that you can increase the signaling in the frontal part of the brain, so this is not hokey pokey. 20 years, I think you will agree, of teamwork, fun, and dare I say excellence, that has been repeatedly reported to the research excellence framework. So we're proud of it. And in this comes our robo number seven, the British robot, Versius. Okay, so here it is. If you haven't seen it, it is in surgical and interventional engineering. We have a, the team here, Steph is here, Anna is here. There is the surgeon, no longer in a console, open console, kinder to the neck, wearing 3D glasses. You can stamp your feet as much as you want. All the controls are in the hands. I used to stamp my feet. There's nothing to do with the feet. It's all in the hands. You know? It's kinder to the neck. The instruments are modular. They are smaller, five millimeter, two millimeter smaller than the Da Vinci system. It's teamwork. It's not just the CMR team, our nurses, fantastic nurses, even our administrators on the right, you see in the center is the administrator, the manager who made it happen. And guess what? During the pandemic, our preceptors couldn't come from Italy. So half the cases were done with Proximy, again designed here uh, within King's Health Partners by Nadine Hakacharam, who is one of our plastic surgeons and co-founders whereby you can transport a surgeon, a virtual scrub in anywhere on earth. So we use Proximy so that we could be guided by our proctors from elsewhere. So the training is very structured. First, you have to go and do e-learning. If you don't, you don't pass. Then you have to do nearly 60 hours of virtual reality lab, a lesson we learned. Must do it. Just because you're an experienced surgeon doesn't mean you can skip that. Then you go and do a dry lab and you do a cadaveric lab before you have implementation time with the team on site. As I said, we use Proximy uh, because half of our cases were preceptored by remote surgeons. So in order to give some structure to this, we fo followed uh, the ideal framework from Peter McCullough and his team uh, as published in the Lancet from Balliol College. So we are at a stage one or stage two A. All the data is prospective. All the videos are recorded. Everything is on a database. This is not just turning up, doing a few retrospective cases and saying, I am a great surgeon. Who cares whether you are a great surgeon or a bad surgeon? And this, dare I say, was just recently, thank you, Ian, published in the British Journal of Urology International as an ideal phase one, two A study. Uh, I had no influence over it. I did send a few texts saying, guys, it's six months, come on. Uh, thank you. But we're really grateful because this is the first such paper in urology in the world. So yet another world first uh, from this department. So the primary outcome uh, was very clear. We had to perform the operation safely without conversion to open or da Vinci surgery. And the secondary outcomes were things like operative time margin status and urinary continence in the patients undergoing robotic radical prostatectomy. So this is the movements uh, of the arms in the virtual uh, reality lab. This is attached as a backpack uh, into the Versius console. You can see the hands of the surgeon, no feet visible on the left, and you can move instruments and practice uh, how to perform this. This is the first stage, ideal stage zero. This is the first uh, cadaveric robotic prostatectomy that I performed, which was shown for the first time over three years ago at the European Robotic Urology section in Marseille. You see a nice nerve sparing, 
except that this is a cadaver. I want you to see these instruments. These are the first generation uh, instruments for suturing, you know, pretty uh, primitive dare I say, but CMR is a listening company. Things have moved on. This is the first robotic prostatectomy ever. On the top you see the symphysis pubis, everything is reversed particularly for the students. So, the urethra is on top, prostate is below, bladder is below that. You can see here I am performing a nerve sparing. You can see the wrists, the nerve sparing is closer on the left side. As I said this patient was a colleague actually, he was a gynecologist and we were very grateful to him for allowing us uh, for him to become the first patient. So, here is the dorsal vein complex being cut and you can see this is a nice length of urethra and you see a little bit of prostate tissue peeping out at the urethra. So, I am uh, correcting my cut so that I get a clear margin. And then you see these uh, instruments which will come in. These are the new needle drivers and I am told today, in fact I have been shown today that the needle drivers are even better and they are continuing to get better and better and better. So, CMR is bringing in new technology, new instruments even as we speak. This is a left sided robotic pyeloplasty. Uh, you can see this is the left ureter. We, uh, uh, we have pre-stented it, we are opening it up uh, and here it is uh, whereby you can see the Maryland on the left hand, the scissors on the right just like the Da Vinci system except it is much smaller. So, this is the crossing vessel uh, which is often seen about 50 percent of patients with a PUJ obstruction have a crossing vessel. So, we are bringing everything, spatulating it, widening it and joining it in front of the crossing vessels just like described originally as an open operation in the 40s by Anderson and Hines. So, again you can do this beautifully without making a big cut on the patient. In fact, I know that our pediatric surgeons are now about to use this machine as the next step. So, you see we have uh, because it was a phase 1 to a study we have done 10 cases, uh, 4 uh, prostatectomies, 3 pyeloplasties, 2 radical nephrectomies and 1 adrenalectomy. And you may say well uh, was the uh, uh, was the primary outcome fulfilled in all cases? Yes, not a single conversion to open or da Vinci surgery and we were not choosing simple cases. Some of these were Gleason 8, 9 tumors. All of them had clear margins thankfully and 50 percent of the patients had immediate return of continence after we removed their catheters. This is uh, from the British Journal of Urology International. I want you to see the, uh, uh, the column the fourth column, uh, the fifth column part, pardon me, which is the bedside unit positioning, BSU positioning. And as you go down the cases, you will see this comes down from nearly 20 minutes to 6, 7 minutes. So, as you get better, the learning curve improves and the positioning of the robot gets better with time. So, we have shown for the first time and now published for the first time in the world that in this study a very stringently designed stage 1 2A study that you can incorporate a new British robot, a cheaper British robot and there will be others coming to the market we hope which will bring the cost down, improve the technology for our patients and you can do it safely despite a 20 year program ahead of it. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to be here today. Um, it's been an amazing day already. I think just seeing the innovation you have downstairs made Ian and I very jealous, I must say. Um, and I think you are all achieving great things here and I wish all of us around not only the UK but the rest of Europe can follow in your footsteps. But congratulations to you and all the team. Um, let me put my cards on the table here. Um, I'm a committed trialist. I grew up in Cochrane and um, I was almost brainwashed into thinking anything but a randomized controlled trial should never be touched because it's clearly going to be biased and hopeless. So to be here today talking to you about big data, I'll lead you through a journey I suppose. And that's a realization that for us 
as surgeons. Our commitment and our purpose is to ensure that we improve the care that we give to patients, their outcomes. And clearly, they must be evidence-based. They must be patient-centered. They must be cost-effective. And importantly, they must be data-driven. This is what our purpose is, should be. And yes, we are surgeons. But let's not forget that what we do with our knives perhaps is 10, 20% of what patients and their families and society expects us to contribute to healthcare and to families going forward. But this has not been easy. As I say, I grew up in Cochrane, we did a lot of trials, we've got in, in, in Aberdeen now perhaps, I don't know, a track record of about 12 NIHR funded randomized trials. Um, I've been involved in perhaps nine of them. You know, and it's great, you publish them in the Lancet. Um, we've got younger mentees, I would call them. Um, Mohamed Abdul Fattah, Eurogynecologist, just published one on slings in New England Journal with us in, in March, and Rakesh Shea has just got his one on photo and, um, in bladder cancer in New England Journal to be coming out soon. But that's great, and we celebrate our CVs, and we think we've achieved great things. And I mentioned just very quickly, I was invited to go and talk to the chairs of the guidelines, the EAU guidelines, many years ago, about 10 years ago. And by the time I finished my presentation about the need for our guidelines to shift from eminence-based guidelines to evidence-based guidelines and the need for Cochrane-style systematic reviews, I was seen as almost an alien, okay? Um, and I must say that between you and I and these four walls, there may have been one or two chairs of those guidelines. These are chairmen in their department or chairwomen in their department, right? That could not tell us the difference between non-randomized prospective studies and case series. They could not tell the difference in the designs. But these are people holding machetes, right? treating patients based on data or papers they've read when they cannot tell the quality about the, the study that's been published that they've read. They only, they only read the title and the conclusions. And so there's been a journey in the guidelines of trying to convert all of the 20 odd panels to become um, more methodologically stronger, which they are now. Um, and these are all positive things. And the guidelines now endorsed in 75 countries. We've trained a lot of European um, uh, young urologists. I see some of them here, Yasmin and others, um, that are outstanding now, okay? But we've still got problems. We've still got problems. Why? Because there are some recommendations with very strong evidence that underpin them, unquestionable. RCT evidence that says you must do A or you must not do B. And there are some recommendations in Europe today where four out of five patients are not having evidence-based care. And we all walk around happily because we're in centers of excellence. That may be great for the patients we treat, but there are many patients, maybe in Albania, in Bulgaria, other areas where we should be concerned about ensuring that the standards we have in here, in London, that those standards are replicated in other centers across Europe, across the world. Because if we don't, we are failing as doctors. Yes, we are surgeons, we may be magnificent technicians, but we are not good doctors if we ignore it. The second area we have a challenge in is that guidelines traditionally are behind the evidence curve because you want the evidence to settle down, right? You want somebody else to repeat it to show that what Procar showed actually was valid and you could, you could show it with your own studies. Um, but that's challenging because 
there isn't enough evidence coming fast enough to validate studies that have been, like RCTs, 90% of what is published in literature is not RCT, right? See, so for prostate cancer, you're gonna to have to wait a long, long time for that to happen. And so in 2016, it was clear that even though I had a fixation about guidelines being underpinned by RCTs, that we needed to do something different because if we didn't, the evidence was gonna be filled by expert opinion. And expert opinion is important, but it mustn't be the only evidence we rely on where there aren't randomized trials. So we, we, we started exploring, taking a, a brave step into the real world data, which is a bit of a mess, I must tell you. But why do we have to do it? RCTs, which I believe in, are not always great. Why? Because they're not generalizable. A lot of RCTs don't have people looking like me, BMI 28, right? Or BMI, typically in Scotland, BMI 35 or 40, right? Half of Scotland will not fit in your RCTs. Multiple comorbidities, multiple drug therapies, the elderly. But we take the results of this finely selected population that had the RCT and we apply it to all of these other people without understanding the impacts on them. We also must not be fooled by centers of excellence having results that are outstanding. We read about them in the European Urology and in Lancet or in the New England Journal. And then we assume this is the standard everywhere else because it isn't. We mustn't assume that what's happening in London here is what's happening in the back of beyond in Aberdeen, right? It may not be the case. We should be duty bound to understand variation in practice and in outcomes. The other gap that we have is that if you look at the data out there retrospectively, there is a huge void in terms of patient reported outcome measures, patient reported experiences of care measures, quality of life, ACOG status, they're missing. But we are doctors, we should care about what patients care about in terms of the outcome. We should not only care about clinical outcomes that we see and after we discharge them, we think they're fine and that's all okay. And this is something that we need to fix. And so we um, led a consortium that secured 10 million or 12 million euro um, from the European Commission called Pioneer, looking at exploring big data for better outcomes for prostate cancer patients and their families. And I must say it's been a long learning experience. We've got 37 partners, a mixture. Bearing in mind, I don't even have coffee bought for me to this day by anyone from industry. So stepping into the world where you have a neutral platform, fantastic academic centers, patient organizations, SMEs, and all the big players in industry on the same neutral platform to identify what we see as the common goal, the bigger picture that we all can commit to and leave our organizational hats at the door when we step in, but accepting that once we tick that box, we also have to respect that everybody, even us as academics, have our own biases and things that we're interested in that, that, that we need to tick. And so we've learned a lot, but we've always had patients at the forefront of what we're going to do. And so in terms of prioritizing gaps, we ran two parallel prioritization exercises, one by clinicians, oncologists, uh, surgeons, and physicians from industry, and then a parallel um, uh, prioritization exercise of the same 56 questions by patients across different countries uh, across Europe. The top 10 from each of those exercises, five questions were the same, right? So patients, when you do explain to them what you're thinking about in terms of research of importance, they have the capability of telling you what is a priority for them or what isn't. And we mustn't forget that. The other challenge we've had along the way, and we've learned a lot of lessons, is how do we gain confidence of our colleagues, researchers, to share data, right? How do we get them, this database they've been sweating over for 30 years in their career, they think it's like diamond dust, and you say to them, please share, it's for the greater good. 
that has taken a bit of uh, <laughs> I had to learn how to renegotiate, right? How we renegotiate with people and show them the value propositions for them to share and making sure they don't feel they're losing control of their data and making sure they see that they can, only, they can not only publish with their own data, but they can also use their data and benchmark against a broader volume of data they could never get access to even if they tried. And slowly but surely, as you can see, we've managed to get big centers to share data, data you would never have imagined before that they would share, including omics, including MRI data, etc. And we've had to develop two different ways of sharing data. A central platform, which is housed in Helmholtz in Germany, where you share your data to the platform, or you keep the data behind your own hospital's firewall, and we send algorithms to your data and aggregated results come out. We assumed the split will be 10-15% central sharing and 85-90% fed, um, federated. As it turns out, 40% have actually shared centrally so far. So it's taken time, it's taken three to four years to get that confidence, but I think when people see that you're not going to steal their data and publish on their data, people start seeing the benefits of actually sharing. It's more labor intensive, of course, if you do it in a federated way. We are also learning how to analyze data at scale. And we ran the first study of Thorn um, in March last year. And that was an amazing experience where patients were with us from the start to the end, making sure the outcomes were, we're, gonna, we're gonna look at were relevant to them. And this is looking at the impact of life expectancy and comorbidities on the outcomes of patients managed conservatively with prostate cancer. And we had people working in Australia when we were asleep. When we were working, they were asleep. Um, and we had 240 odd participants online. Uh, these are incredible, not only clinicians, but analytics experts, AI experts, etc. We had people that had not shared data join the study a thought, right? They come because their data is already in a common data model, OMOP, they come and they join. And we had access to close to 2 million prostate cancer patients to run these studies on. And so you can imagine the, 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 the learning curve in trying to understand how to deal with quality of data, how to make sure the data is harmonized in a particular way. If it's not mapped to OMOP, OMOP is the common standard, the most common standard now for data to be mapped to, to allow us to be able to uh, do analytics such as this. Well, we had data from industry, we had data from the US, um, and from incredible European collaborators. The other challenge we have, of course, is having done all of this, and having gone, got results into guidelines, the biggest challenge we have is, actually, who's gonna follow those recommendations? Surgeons, we're not the greatest in changing behavior. Once you've been trained to do things in a particular way, to get a surgeon to change and do it differently, irrespective of what, they, even if the evidence slaps them in the face, it's a hard sell. Uh, and I think for us, uh, we have a major bit of work we need to do. Um, we need to understand what are the variations in practice today. Big data, great, but it's of no use if the insights you learn cannot be implemented in practice. And let's not underestimate how tough that is, implementing, changing behavior to demonstrate impact. And there are barriers. The barriers can be academic, scientific, which can be the most subtle and the most difficult to change, to just in this country, this treatment is not available or it's not reimbursed. There are many reasons why, and these are things that we need to commit to, to understand those barriers, to be able to bring in facilitators to allow people to be able to implement uh, recommendations. So we've started now, having, having thought that, uh, you know, going to the guidelines will allow dramatic things to happen, well, it, it isn't. Uh, and we have to go to the next level, and that is implementation science. And we've started a project called Imagine that is now being led by the guidelines office, where we choose a recommendation, and we've collaborated. This was actually a prostate cancer recommendation. I do not give neoadjuvant um, ADT before radical prostatectomy for patients with localized prostate cancer. And we collaborated with national societies across Europe, 31 countries, 187 hospitals, 
um, almost 7,000 patients over a six month period, data was gathered from them to see what is the adherence rate. There is no guideline in the world of any quality that says you must give people ADT before radical prostatectomy for localized disease. There isn't. So in theory, adherence should be 100%, no question. Um, we've covered that. And that's the spread of the countries that we collected data from. We had a GDPR compliant platform to allow data to be collected quite easily. The adherence rate from this first pilot range from 100% in some centers, which is fantastic, but it dropped to 75%, 74%, right? Um, now, of course, for the 25% that, that had ADT, not only are you giving them a treatment that is not needed, that costs money, you're giving them a treatment that potentially gives them cardiac adverse effects and other things, which is even worse. Um, finally, I, I would say, Big data, we have, as, as I said, we're going to be learning a lot about it, but I think the one area we must focus on um, as I close is look at how we individualize guidelines. At the moment, these are PDFs. So you do your research, you do your innovation, you publish it in the Lancet or wherever. Hopefully, it's picked up by the guidelines panel. Hopefully, it impacts a recommendation. But you're sitting in a clinic, right? You're, you're pressured. You've got 35, 40 patients. How many of us? pick up a guideline, open it and go, okay, what, 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 you know, what should I do with this patient? I don't think, you know, in a clinic where you're seeing people coming in every 10 minutes, I mean, I don't do it. I should be embarrassed to say that. I mean, I was the chair of the guideline. We don't do it. And I think we need to find a way of making it easier where guidelines are interfaced onto the electronic health records so that you get prompts at the appropriate moments when you're in practice at the bedside to be able to help surgeons like us change our practice. And so we embarked on another project in, uh, funded by the European Commission that we're coordinating, looking at not only prostate cancer, but looking at prostate cancer, breast cancer, and lung cancer. And make no mistake, 80% of the issues we have in prostate cancer are across the same in other cancers, right? So it made sense that for solid tumors like this, it meant that I personally, I didn't know all the personalities because the breast cancer people and the lung cancer people, they're a slightly different breed to us benign urologists. So managing this consortium of 37 partners again is a little bit tricky, but I think it is important that we learn from each other and they can teach us things, we can teach them things. And in this project, we're going to look at not only identifying the gaps in guidelines, not only looking at bringing in big data so that you can see this guy, um, black guy, James, who's 56, drinks a bottle of wine more than he maybe should sometimes. Huh? Low, rate, low, rate, low grade or intermediate risk prostate cancer weighs, I don't know, BMI 27. How many of those people do you have on that platform? And how did they do with surgery? How did they do with... We need to be able to use data that is already available, not just from centers of excellence published from the Martinique Clinic or from King's, generally, that is generalizable to be able to advise patients on their outcomes. And we hope that with the innovations, we have an AI work package and amazing AI people, including those from Cassius in the Helmholtz in Germany, amazing people in Federated Analytics and AI, that will hopefully help us start joining connections that we would not have ordinarily been able to join in terms of the magnitude of real world data uh, and cohorts we have to work with. Um, we now have commitment of, of, uh, for data across 200 million people, um, 7 million of those, or, or 58 million of those um, in the US. No, you're testing my eyesight, you know, Proka. That, that, I mean, I think I may need to go and check my glasses again. Um, 7 million biobanks uh, from, from biobanks and trial and cohorts in over 6,000 participants. Um, a lot of data. We've learned a lot in Pioneer about how not to do things, how to get data into a common data model. It costs money, it takes time to map the data. Um, to map an electronic health record in one hospital will cost you about 80 to 100,000 euro to do that. So it's a huge amount of investment. So we need to get smart on how we map data that, doesn't, that is not so labor intensive and costs so much. 
but the opportunities uh, are clearly huge. But I think having done all of that, what we as doctors, doctors first and foremost, before we, we are surgeons, what we should be committed is how we gather evidence, data, from different sources and have a hub where we can, a knowledge hub that we can guide that data, understand it, gain confidence in the estimates of effects of treatments from across different data sources to be able to reliably inform practice and guidance. This is something that we need to do and we need to be able to link up not only and we're committed to this. So not only are we going to start collecting prospective data from prostate cancer patients, directly from patients, including their PROMs, PREMs, et cetera, we will make sure that that platform is linked to projects like Pioneer, Optima, the, EH, the EHDS, the European Health Data Space that is being embarked on now, and Darwin that is being supported by EMA to make sure that we have a joined up system. It's not gonna be easy, right? But we must be committed to changing the culture of how we think, how we behave, how we approach practice, and we can't do it alone. So we will need all of you, right, um, to stand with us. It wasn't easy to change eminence to evidence, but I think this is gonna be worse, far worse. But if, the, if it's the last thing we do before we go six foot deep, well, at a personal level, I'm willing to walk the walk, even if I have to do it alone. But I know I won't be alone. We have, you know, you need to be really crazy to be in this field. And I'm blessed to say, there are crazier people than me, I've, I've realized. This makes me feel good, right? Uh, so, I think on that note, Proka, let me firstly just thank you and the team for this very kind invitation. Um, I was really excited to be here today, and I think what I've seen really makes me hugely jealous, and I think congratulations to you all down here. And I think being so close to the parliament, maybe that helps a little, right? Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Procore, for the uh, introduction. Um, I think the answer to the question is you've got to be optimistic about these things. Um, last October, I started work um, for NHS England as one of two national clinical directors for elective care um, with a lady called Stella Vig, whom some of you will know, she's a vascular surgeon, general surgeon from Croydon. And although the title is elective care, in reality our focus is on elective recovery. And, you know, you all read the newspapers, you, you, you can see this sort of stuff. There was a waiting list which was going up. It was going up for all sorts of reasons. Um, two and a half years ago, I sat in the Royal College of Surgeons with the then President and, and uh, Sir Simon Stevens, where it was acknowledged that the bed base in this country for elective surgery was too small. Uh, and that was January 2020. At that stage, COVID was just a rumor. Uh, it's somewhere in the Far East. Um, so then we had COVID. And you can see from the graph that the, the waiting list has gone up, the, 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 the angle has changed and it's going up and it continues to go up. Um, not only that, is that the way, we, but the way we practice medicine, practice surgery has changed. There's far more friction in the system. Our activity levels are still not back to 100%. Referral levels, interestingly, are not back to 100%, and I'll talk a little bit more about referral levels in a minute. Um, and the way that we continue to practice, the way that we still are wearing masks, um, really does affect our ability to, to treat patients. For those of you who are competitive, these, this is how the waiting list is broken down. Those are the top 10 specialties. You'll see, the urologist will see number six, I think. Um, but the numbers, the numbers of patients who are on waiting lists are enormous. But that isn't the whole story. That isn't even the whole waiting list. Um, this is a graph, if you just sort of describe the graph, the, the, the blue line was 2019. Uh, cancer referrals, two week wait referrals in England, all specialties. Um, the green line is what happened in 2020. Red is 2021 and yellow is 2022. And you can see that the pandemic 
led to a very significant reduction in two-week wait referrals, potential cancer referrals. The following year, there's been a bit of a bounce back, and that bounce back has continued even more uh, in 2022. So that now, two-week wait referrals, all specialties in England, is running at about 120% of what it was in 2019. And does that matter? Well, it does matter. If you go back, and this is the latest data I could get out of the Cancer Directorate, these are the missing cancers. Uh, and from a urological perspective, you'll see that the biggest missing, missing cancer, the biggest cancer of all miss, that's missing, uh, is prostate cancer. And it's not difficult to hypothesize why that's happened. Patients weren't going to their GPs, they weren't getting PSA tests, um, and therefore we're not, we have not seen all the missing prostate cancers yet. Procol would have broken his record if they'd all come through in the last 12 months or so. But you can see there's other cancers that are missing. There's skin cancers, there's colorectal cancers, uh, there's some bladder cancers uh, that are missing. Um, so the question is, where are those cancers? Well, could they be here? This is, I've, taught, I've shown you the, the two-week wait referral picture. This is the elective referral picture, and you can see a very, very similar pattern, um, but with one crucial difference. That is, although there was a big loss of activity in 2020, we are still not yet back to 2019 levels in terms of elective referrals. We're still only running at about 95%, 97% of the 2019 levels of non two week wait elective referrals. And actually, we'd expect to see something like a two to 3% growth each year. And does that matter? Well, I didn't believe this slide when I first saw it. This is 2016 data, so it may have changed. These are the numbers and the proportions of cancer that come to our service from non two week wait pathways. And you can see that numerically, the urological cancers are a significant number. A lot of those cancers come from non two week wait referrals. And it may be that that loss of the elective referrals is partly to explain for those missing cancers. And indeed, one of the jobs that we're, we're looking at is whether we can do something to, to our elective waiting list to, to understand and perhaps identify those patients with cancer. So what we've got, and this is another piece of work that I'm involved with, is trying to work out whether there's going to be a bounce back, when there's going to be a bounce back, how big that bounce back is going to be, because it affects the waiting list. And as you can imagine, uh, the people just across the river are very interested in when that bounce back occurs, because everything's gamed on a general election in two years' time, and the size of the waiting list will be really quite important. And so we're trying to do almost the impossible and model the missing patients. Have they gone to the independent sector? Have they been admitted urgently? Have they died? You know, I'm afraid COVID did uh, take quite a lot of people with significant comorbidities. And Peter Johnson, who's the National Clinical Director for, for Cancer, wonders whether our missing bladder cancers have actually all died because they died of COVID in the interim. And this is, some of you will have read the newspaper, read the BBC last week. This is the independent sector data, which shows there has been a very significant increase in self-funded independent sector activity, which will feed into the modelling. Uh, so something like 60,000 extra self-funded elective procedures in England uh, in the last three quarters of last year. Uh, a focus on the South East uh, and, and London. Uh, that's where the greatest wealth is. That's where the mount, most money can be. But if you look at some of those procedures, a doubling of the self-funding for total hips and total knees and a near doubling for cataract surgery. So that may affect the size and, and, and timing of any bounce back. So in response to that problem, again, you will all know there is a plan. And in many ways, this was, was what led me to apply uh, uh, and, and, and to want to take this job. Because in my career, uh, consultant career, there have been two really big uh, chunks of money thrown at the NHS. The first one was thrown by the Brown Blair government about 20 years ago. 
and it did get the waiting list down, but there was very little lasting benefit for the NHS. A lot of it was thrown at uh, the independent sector to get those waiting lists down. The amount of investment that are, that, that's been given and promised is, to my mind, a real opportunity to put in place an NHS with the appropriate capacity and hopefully the processes to ensure that not only can we deal with a backlog, but we will produce some resilience for the health service uh, during winter. So what are the, the, the government challenges? The, this is what the government, the politicians, promise to the public. And it's about wait times, it's about cancer access, uh, it's about enhanced capacity of diagnostics, uh, and it's about uh, transformation of the outpatient service. Uh, and that is what has effectively been guaranteed for patients by the politicians in the plan. Behind that, and th this is a pretty stunning uh, picture, but this is developed by modelling within the Department of Health, is an expectation that an NHS that was functioning at 90% capacity just a year ago will be functioning at 127% capacity by 24-25. And indeed, the recovery from the pandemic is predicated upon that increased volume of activity. And you can see with the different chunks as you go across the screen as to how that might be achieved. If we can produce less friction in the system so that we can work more efficiently, if we can increase capacity, if we can get more patients treated in other ways, which includes the independent sector and includes weekend operating and so on. Um, and includes transformation and demand management. Then we get to a position whereby we can deliver that 120% which will lead, if it all goes according to plan, by a waiting list that is coming down just in time for the next general election. And that's the various tools that have been put in place, which is about capacity, it's about transformation, it's about workforce, uh, and there's lots of things, and many of you will be familiar with many of those uh, interventions. I don't have time to talk through them all, and I'm going to focus on three or four of them, um, it would be perverse here not to talk a little bit about surgery, uh, but actually I need to talk about outpatients, a little bit about digital, and a little bit about health inequalities. So, surgical hubs. Again, you'll have heard this. This is being pro pro uh, pronounced as one of the solutions by the colleges, uh, and indeed NHS England has bought into it. The concept of ring-fenced, perhaps green site, surgical facilities where the emergencies, where the medical patients can't block uh, our surgical activity and whereby we can get used to get back to starting our theatre lists on time and operating with the security that the next patient on the list has a bed to go to rather than the stop-start way in which many of our theatre lists function. There are already a significant number of surgical hubs. The dark blue dots are those hubs that already exist and the light blue hubs that are those that will be in place uh, by 24-25. Uh, you can see from the scatter of the dots on the map that conurbations do a lot better than rural areas. So one of the parts of the country that has the biggest difficulty with elective surgical hubs is the southwest, where the geographical spacing of those, all those institutions make it very difficult not to put the hub onto the acute site. There is, of course, the risk that if the hub is on the acute site, that it'll fall down in winter, as we inevitably have to deal with winter pressures. But if you can get those hubs working properly, then you should be able to improve both efficiency and productivity and get back to training our trainees. To help organisations do that, there is now something that you can all access, something called a model hospital. You can log in, you can get a login code, and this will give you information about your specialty and how it compares to peers, and how, how your efficiency and productivity in your theatre works. So this is uh, the West Yorkshire ICS. I'm part of an integrated care system, which is West Yorkshire. They're the grey and the black, and that's the rates of day case TURPs, and the GERFT team have arbitrarily put a level of what, that, what the optimal level should be, but you can see first and foremost that there's enormous variation. And by nature, surgeons are pretty competitive, and so if they see that their organisation is not 
achieving the target, then they will often change things in order to make that happen. This is about productivity. These are delayed starts. Uh, we all know that if you're in an operating theatre, you want to start on time, you want minimum gaps between theatre, you don't want early finishes, you want minimal touch, you want good touch time. And all those metrics are available uh, at a system level, at a trust level, and with the next month or so at a theatre level. So we'll be able to tell which the productive theatres are and which are the inefficient theatres are. And hopefully it will help with this. This is the urology surgical logbook during the pandemic, and you can see what happened. Uh, trainees stopped operating, and a significant number, I think about 15% of urological, CC, of urological um, ACP, ARCPs were delayed. That number is 30% in orthopedics, which has led to a significant delay in CCT holders, which is making the workforce problems even worse. I think we all believe that surgical hubs will provide a protected environment that trainees can regain some of those surgical skills. It would be remiss of me not to talk about outpatients and the simple reason for this is although the waiting list is 6.36 million, only 17% of those patients are on a waiting list to be admitted. The other 83% are somewhere in the outpatient system. They're either waiting to see a doctor or they've seen a doctor and had a test or well, they've had the test and are waiting for the result. That's the so-called non-admitted pathways. And you can see, for all the specialties, the surgical specialties included, the vast majority of our waiting list is actually in the outpatients. It's not on the theatre waiting list. Uh, and the highlighted ones are the only specialties that go above 30%. Urology is down at 22%, so, so a fifth of our waiting list is on a theatre waiting list, 80% is on the outpatient waiting list. And surgeons love outpatients, don't they? I hear you've had a few problems here in the past week or so. Um, and we've done a bit of work. And actually, if you talk to clinicians in clinic, you find there's all sorts of pinch points and dissatisfactions with the way that clinics run. And this is some of them. I'll try just to highlight a few. Uh, a clunky triage, paper-based process. We do triage by paper. The referral comes in, it gets printed, it gets scanned onto a machine, we get downloaded, it, we triage it, it goes back in the same route. Bizarre. Um, patients turning up to clinic without the results of the tests. Data systems, systems that don't talk to each other, so you have to have four or five different systems on your computer while you're trying to do a clinic. We know at the back end of the pathway, some patients are, are, are socially used to coming back to clinic unnecessarily. I'm currently dealing with the backlog of a, a trainee or two who did a number of unsupervised clinics, and I don't think they discharged a patient in a, year, in a whole year. And there's good data that shows that consultants are more likely to discharge than trainees, who are more likely to discharge than nurses. And it's not because they're, they're, they're incompetent, it's just they, they are insecure in their clinical decisions. And so the safest thing to do is to bring the patient back or do another test and bring the patient back. And secure discharge is something we could change. So if you take the outpatient pathway, uh, and as sort of James alluded to, most parts of the patient pathway has nothing to do with surgery. Most of it's about the referral, getting them into hospital, getting the diagnosis, and then getting the treatment, and then discharging them. And a small proportion might need an operation. So we can change it. We can make triage better. Um, advice and guidance can be more robust. I know that London, so most of the people in this room have moved or will be about to move some, to something called advice and refer, where effectively you can provide advice and guidance for every referral that comes in. Um, you can, there's a massive increase in diagnostic capacity. In, in, in parallel to the surgical hubs, there are coal site community diagnostic centres that are being built at the same sort of scale across the whole country. Um, we've got a lot of work to do on pathways. As a non-prostate cancer doctor, I can only look in admiration to the way that the, the diagnostic pathway for somebody with a raised PSA has been utterly revolutionized over the past 10 years. Part of the pressure for that has been wait times. And we've never yet applied the same rigor or innovation to benign pathways. Single stop clinics, this place, Tim has led the, the one-stop urological clinic 
which is the model which we sh all should be pursuing, not only in urology but in other specialties. That's a really efficient way to reduce outpatient consultations, give the patient a diagnosis quite quickly. But we also need to do some work at the back of the pathway to get secure discharge, to provide trainees with the security to make sensible decisions, and to think about alternative methods, things called patient-initiated follow-up, whereby we let patients act in the same way they do with the GP. You give them information, you give them a route back into the hospital, and you say, you call us if there's a problem, but we're not going to arrange to see you. And then at the same time, we've got digital innovation. I was lucky enough to attend um, a seminar Steve Powers held the other week uh, in which a number of the NHS clinical entrepreneurs presented their, their innovations. And they're all companies, they're all trying to sell you something. But there are fantastic innovations out there. So this is a digital platform for dermatologists whereby the patient uploads the, a photograph of the rash, fills in a questionnaire, is referred in, the consultants sit asynchronously, they don't have to be direct, they can then go through all these things. Uh, and the data shows that 30, 40% of those referrals are returned to GPs. They are able to triage the referrals into appropriate specialist clinics and fast track the potential cancers through. Virtual Lucy, it's called, and the data all comes from actually a dermatologist and an orthopedic surgeon in Leeds. This is an AI program uh, developed at UCL that predicts non-attendance in the outpatient clinic with a 92% accuracy and is then able to put in place measures to reduce that. And most non-attendance is because it's not socially suitable for somebody who's at work or who can't get to hospital. Uh, this is a program designed by a neurosurgeon uh, which provides automated follow-up for cataracts. So you don't get seen by a clinician, you get phoned up by a machine who asked you about the follow-up of their cataracts, and there's an NIHR study to look at this, and it's being rolled out to routine follow-up of another, a number of high-volume procedures. And this is a, an app designed by an optometrist, uh, which allows patient monitoring of vision at home, which avoids regular outpatient follow-up for patients on some ophthalmic pathways. And there are loads of these innovations. But there's a problem. And the problem is that if we are going to digitally transform and innovate, and I really genuinely think we do, we have the problem of the multiple programs on the computer in the outpatient clinic, which really doesn't work for any of us. And getting that simplicity and getting it all joined up is really, really important. And quite frankly, although NHS England recognises this to be a challenge, we're only part way along the journey to join up the digital solution that will, re that will support uh, recovery. Finally, health inequalities. It won't surprise you at all to know that the most socially deprived parts of this country have the longest waiting lists. Uh, those two things are not unrelated. There's all sorts of reasons whereby that might be. The real question is how do you, how do you solve it? So let me just give you a little analogy. So you've got a couple of patients awaiting a hip replacement. One's been waiting 16 weeks, I think I said. 26 weeks, one's been waiting 44 weeks. Who gets the date on the operating list? Well, it's the patient who's been waiting longest. And that's the data we work on at the moment. But if you feed in other information, you might make a different decision. If the patient who's been waiting less time has actually got more comorbidities, is attending A&E because they're falling over, you may well end up doing something different. And indeed, a, a clinician in, um, in Coventry, uh, the medical director there who's a cardiologist, they've piloted for the past 12 months a different way of prioritizing, which includes these other things, including age and comorbidities and attendance at A&E and possible other medical problems and to some extent social problems. And what they've demonstrated is that, that over a 12 month period, from a starting position where the most deprived patients were waiting, what was it, seven, five months, five weeks longer than the least deprived patients, they brought the waiting times down for both, but they've reduced that health inequality for orthopedics and they've done it for lots of other specialties. I'm sorry. But will we get there? 
there's lots of challenges. The first challenge is COVID. COVID hasn't gone away. We're just dealing with uh, the, the back end of, of another wave. We lost 20% of our theatre lists two weeks ago because of staff shortages because of COVID. Um, social distancing is interesting. You all wear masks here. We don't all wear masks in Leeds, interestingly. Um, we only do it in clinical environment. In a room like this, we wouldn't have to wear a mask. There are different rules in different places and, 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 and each organisation is, is making those rules on their own in order to try and get back to a more normal activity. But until we do, there's going to be continued friction in the system. There's an enormous workforce problem. Again, report from the Health and Care, Health and Care Select Committee this week, background absence of 100% of 100,000 people, despite an attempt to recruit from overseas, there are problems with morale, burnout, and COVID illness. Um, Urgent and emergency care. I don't know what, your, what Guys and Thomas's is like, but we've had the busiest June on record in Leeds uh, for urgent and emergency care. Uh, lots of patients coming to A&E. You can't get them out of A&E because there's no beds in the hospital. You can't get beds out of patients out of hospital because there's no beds in community care. There has been a collapse in social care in this country uh, in, for all sorts of reasons, but in large part because of pay. Uh, and that urgent care pressure affects our ability to undertake elective surgery. And finally, winter is coming. I, I'm told that we're going to get another COVID wave, wave in October or November. Uh, if we follow Australia, we'll most certainly have quite a bad flu wave for the first time in two or three years, which is why you'll all need to get immunised against flu, and that will affect our workforce once again. So there are lots and lots of challenging challenges. I remain optimistic. I wouldn't be doing this job if, if I wasn't. Um, I think it is an opportunity. Uh, we've got an enormous waiting list, which is, which, of which a significant proportion uh, is hidden. And that waiting list is not just about surgery. And it's really important that we not only make our surgery more protected and efficient, uh, but also that we transform the way that we, we deal with patients across the whole pathway. Dealing with recovery is not about doing more, simply doing more of what we did before. We've got to change what we do as well as growing that capacity. We've had exceptional, unusual funding from government, uh, and it really is an opportunity to try and put in place the building blocks, the surgical hubs, the CDCs, uh, and so on, that hopefully will get us through this and protect us a little bit more against winter pressures. Um, but at the heart of it, and I've given you a few examples throughout, clinical leadership, I think, is absolutely essential. Hubs and Gerft would not have happened without somebody called Tim Briggs, who's an orthopaedic surgeon, who was, who was touting around, get it right first time in 2016 when I was involved in the English College. And he persisted and it stuck and it is effective. Kieran Patel, who's the medical director in Coventry, who, who has introduced that tool relating to health inequalities, has led that change in his organisations. All those technological and uh, AI innovations are all clinicians. They're all part of Tony Young's uh, NHS entrepreneurs. And I strongly believe that if we're going to get our way out of this mess, it requires clinical leadership and clinical innovation. And that, quite frankly, is why I remain optimistic. Thank you very much.